All right, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Zimmerman, who is a professor of history of education at the University of Pennsylvania. His work examines how education practices and policies have developed over time and the myths that often cloud our understanding of teaching and learning. He has a particular interest in how political and social movements come to shape education. Additionally, he's also written for the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, and many more. So Dr. Zimmerman, thanks for coming on today. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. So when did you first get interested in the history of education and then culture wars? You know, it actually goes back to my youth. Uh, I had a rather unusual and I think hugely privileged youth insofar as my parents were in the Peace Corps. And so as an elementary school kid, I grew up in Asia. I grew up in India and Iran. Wow. Uh, and in India, believe it or not, I went to an all girls school, which explains a lot. <laughs> um, it, it was on the British model. And if you're familiar with that, you know, with the all girls schools in the younger grades, they take a small handful of boys. And I was one of those boys. Wow. Uh, and in Iran, I went to a truly international school at a time in the late 60s when, you know, Tehran was this incredibly cosmopolitan place and a magnet for people from all over the world. And I think those experiences uh, definitely, um, uh, definitely uh, contributed to my own uh, Peace Corps experience, that is choosing to join the Peace Corps myself. And when you put them all together, I think what they did was they just made me uh, fascinated by and often obsessed by the different ways that human beings have organized themselves to educate each other. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 how, how we do that in different parts of the world and how our differences are expressed or not through our education systems. To me, those are the most important questions. And I think I've lived them uh, uh, through, again, the, the, the incredibly lucky circumstances of my youth and, and early adulthood. Yeah, I mean, that's it's such a critical aspect that I think people often take for granted, uh, just education, how it shapes your society in so many ways, um, and, and how many of the problems that you may have in a society is because of the education system that you have. Um, yeah. So it's just critical. Right, and and it shapes us, and obviously we shape it as well, and that's the yeah. tension that's run through my scholarship. So, you know, uh, uh, um, architects often quote Winston Churchill saying we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. Mm -hmm. I think the same goes for our schools, not just our school buildings, of course, but yeah. just the whole apparatus, uh, the whole kind of ideological and cultural structure of schooling. It creates us, but in democracies, we create it. Sure. Um, and so it goes back and forth. Yeah. So how did you end up getting interested then in culture wars, which seem to be quite a popular topic today? So <laughs> you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you know, um, uh, I think I think part of it has to do with my own experiences as a school teacher, both in Nepal and in the United States. So I served in the Peace Corps myself in Nepal after college, and then I came back and I taught in the public schools of Vermont and um, and also of Maryland and Baltimore. Okay. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I learned as a school teacher was how many different ideas people had about what schools should do. And so if if by a culture war in education, you mean a clash between different citizens about the meaning and purpose of school, that seems to me inevitable. We've always had sure. that. Um, uh, and and what what I started to do was just research the way that we had conducted those debates over time. Uh, and in, in two broad fields, the fields of religion and history. And yeah. just because we've always had them doesn't mean they've, <clears throat> sorry, remained the same. Obviously, they've changed over time. But I think the tension is the through line. Mm -hmm. That is the tension between different conceptions of what schools should be doing. I think that is um, part of democracy. Um, it'll always be with us. The, the question isn't whether we're going to have cultural conflict over schools. The question is, what forms of that conflict take over time? And how can we, if not settle these conflicts, resolve them? Those, to me, are the questions. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, so, you know, culture wars in American schools have um, clearly been going on for as long as the education system has existed. Um, and so, you know, how has that debate changed over time, in your view? And is it worse than it's ever been? Or is it about the same as it's been at different periods? Or, you know, what's your thought on that? Yes. Well, to answer this question, Ben, I'm going to go into the weeds just a little bit. That's okay. It's, it's necessary. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, 
Uh, I wrote a book in 2002 called Who's America? And the subtitle was, to the point of your question, Culture Wars in the Public Schools. And what I argued very briefly in that book was that the religion wars, the culture wars over religion in schools had no solution and the history wars had the wrong one. The religion okay. wars, if by that we mean evolution creation, school prayer, Bible reading, sex education, insofar as it's inflected by religion, which it was, they had no solution, I argued, because they, they involved mutually incommensurate claims. So either he was the son of man and the savior, or he wasn't. Right. Either, either sex outside of straight marriage is a sin or it isn't. There wasn't any possibility of compromise there. So I, I argued they would always be with us because they can't be settled. Meanwhile, the history wars, our wars over history, I argued, they had been settled, but in a wrong way. They had the wrong solution. The way we settled history wars was by adding new groups to the old story. Okay. So um, uh, uh, if, you've, if you've seen any textbook today, you know that they're not just about white men anymore. Right. Uh, this is why they're like 800 pages long and the middle school kids get like back problems hauling them around. They're about all the diversity of America. But what I argued in my first edition was that as more and more groups petitioned to be part of the story, which certainly they are and should be, mm -hmm. that sadly they got folded into the same Uber story. Uh -huh. So we added new groups, but we didn't ask the question about what their addition should do to the way we imagine America itself. Yeah. So the books became more diverse um, uh, in terms of the populations that are described and represented, but they remained static in terms of the overall theme. So mm -hmm. we added more groups to the same story. And the story you could see in the titles of the textbooks, you know, Rise of the American Nation, Quest for Liberty. Uh, and it was Jim Lowen who wrote, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, who had this fabulous line, have you ever noticed that the physics book is not the triumph of the atom? Okay. Right? You know, yeah. rock is the periodic table. Yeah. No, only the history book has that title. So that was 2002. The religion wars have no solution. The history wars have the wrong one. Well, the reason I just came out with a new edition, a 20th anniversary edition, is because a whole lot changed in the intervening two <laughs> decades. I wouldn't have done a new edition if I didn't believe that, right? Yeah. So sure. I have a new part three that covers that territory and also establishes a new argument about what happened. And the very short story then is that the religion wars cooled radically and the history wars flared as never before. Um, so the religion wars cooled radically um, uh, when was the last time you heard about a big, fiery debate about evolution and creation in the school district? Um, just to be clear, Ben, they yeah. do exist. That yeah. still happens, sure. but in a, very, in a very minor key. Ditto for school prayer. Ditto for Bible reading. Um, and even sex education has become much less inflected by religion. So the religion was cool for a couple of reasons. The most obvious one, and the one that we talk about the least, is the country became radically less religious. Yeah, I think yeah. this is the most important change in America that we're the least aware of. And I think it's because we're so close to it. So it's it's all very difficult to measure. And the way the social scientists usually do is, you know, reported denominational affiliation and reported weekly attendance at religious you know, uh, events, ceremonies, rituals. It seems like in 20 years we went down 20 percent. It's remarkable. Yeah, that, I mean, it's we're, crazy not, we're not we're not Western Europe yet. Right. But we're obviously trending in that direction. So that's one thing. So when the country becomes less religious, it does make sense that you would have less religious conflict around the schools. The other really important thing is that the Orthodox believers during these past 20 years increasingly exempted themselves from public schools altogether, mm. either via, you know, these Christian academies, which boomed and other kinds of, you know, Jewish day schools and so on. Um, but also, most importantly, through homeschooling, which incidentally is the most important thing in education we talk the least about. Hmm. Um, you know, we don't know how many kids are homeschooled. There may be as many as kids who attend charter schools, but there yeah. are a hundred books about charter schools for every one book about homeschool. Wow. Uh, why? Because people who write about this subject send their kids to charter schools and don't homeschool them. That's what I think, which is the <laughs> lamest possible explanation, right? Homeschooling is super significant. I think it had a very significant effect on the culture wars. Because again, if you're homeschooling your kid or if you're patronizing a Christian academy, it's going to be less likely you're going to be in, engaged in these battles, right? I mean, yeah. you've, essentially, you've essentially left the battle. Yep. So 
The religious wars cooled. They didn't go away, but they cooled. The history wars flared as never before. And, and in ways that have been deeply troubling to me. Remember in 2002, I said that we weren't really arguing about America. We were just adding different groups to the same story. Then, as per the Chinese proverb, be careful what you wish for. Right. <laughs> um, we absolutely are arguing about America right now. The, the whole thing, the big kahuna. Yeah. Um, but the problem is I think we don't have a vocabulary really to speak across our differences. And most of all, to the point of my book, our schools aren't really helping us do that. Most of this battle over America, you think about the 1619 Project or critical yep. race theory, all these things, it's happened above the schools, not inside them. Um, uh, and I think there are a lot of different reasons for that, which we can talk about. But, you know, we, we're having that battle now, but we're not really having it in the schools. We're having it above and outside the schools. Um, uh, if I were king, and we don't have enough time this morning to enumerate all the reasons that will never happen, every <laughs> high school kid would receive the 1619 Project and the state-approved textbook. Yeah. The teacher would be like, okay, let's start with Columbus. Like, what does 1619 say? What does your textbook say? Let's do the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. What does 1619 say? What does your textbook say? Um, in fairness, I should tell you there are some teachers doing this. But they're, yeah. they're a very small minority, and we can talk about reasons for that as well. Um, but we are shouting past each other. We're not communicating with each other. And I think the scariest idea is that, and this is not original to me, that as we became less religious in a formal sense, like fewer church attendance, denominations, all that, we actually became quasi-religious in our politics red and blue yeah. became our religions yes right yes. Yeah. um uh but without the tempering effect that formal religion has then i'm just going to say it people like me who write about religion were just wrong on this <laughs> like we imagine that when the country became less religious it would become more tolerant yeah. that was basically the argument because religion was a source of irrationality and intolerance and all kinds of terrible terrible stuff well you know what we were just wrong. Yeah. What happened in the last two decades is the country became less religious, again, in a formal sense, and radically more intolerant. Yeah. And I think blue and red, in some ways, again, became quasi-religions. And what we lack is really a language to talk across them. Um, uh, because, you know, there are many former religions, and I'll include my own Judaism in this, right? I mean, sure. you know, they're, they're, they're actually, I, I think, they can and they have been also forces of liberalism. They've tempered our worst impulses. They've encouraged us um, to make alliances with people that believe different things. Um, uh, red and blue doesn't work that way, right? Not in America right now. It's like if you're a red, the blues are just horrible human beings. And your only job is to defeat them, not communicate with them. Yeah. And, yeah. and it works the other way, too. Uh, um, vice versa. Yeah. So I think that's I think that's where we are. Yeah, I guess it just shows just how you know, kind of this ability to be intolerant is is kind of built into human beings to a certain extent, where there's always that impulse to to view those who are different than you as as kind of this enemy. And of course, in societies you know that are not religious, you know, look at the the Cold War era and you know, atheistic societies that have uh, very much been intolerant of other people in, in different ways. So. It is something kind of this human phenomena that we're trying to constantly deal with. Correct, correct. But of course, you know, the, the social and structural, uh, I'm sorry, the social and, and cultural structures that we create around us, yeah. right, influence the way that we address the intolerance you're yep. describing, yeah. right? Um, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think for the reasons I was describing, we have just, we've reached sort of maximum intolerance. Yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty disturbing. I mean, I was... I guess I was, you know, going to college for undergrad really kind of when I started to see lots of the stuff pop up, um, you know, graduating and I started in 2013 and then graduated in 2017. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like a time when there's a lot of stuff going on, much more so than my, my brother or my sister who are, you know, seven and 10 years older than me. And I was like, wow, this is a huge change already yes. this quick. Um, Where did you go to college? 
So I went to, I did my undergrad at St. John's University, a small Catholic school in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. Um, yeah. I'm not Catholic, it's so that, that was the interesting. Johnnies, the Johnnies, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Johnnies, that's right. Yeah. And um, then I did my master's at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So a very different, different world type of situation. Um, but seeing seeing the culture wars kind of play out in, in various fields in the humanities, especially, it was really interesting because, um, you know, you could go into a class and you'd hear a professor say something and then you'd go on the internet and see articles about people debating these issues. I'm like, wow, I'm actually living through them. Um, right. So right. It, very but, fascinating. But, but, right. But it's interesting, Ben, that you said you go into the internet and see people debating these issues, right? Yes. I mean, I think that obviously there's a lot of debate that happens on the internet, but as we all know, a lot of it is, you know, incredibly snarky and oh, for sure, and yeah. and, and uh, mutually hostile. And yeah. what we need is for our schools and colleges to teach a different and a better way of conducting that debate. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they can unless we create enough sentiment in favor of doing that. Yeah, right? yeah, and that's the great that's the great irony, and that's the tension that's run through my entire work, right? That exercise that I described with the 1619 Project and the state approved textbook, that's an example of what I call democratic education. Not mm -hmm. capital D like Joe Biden, Kamala Harris education, sure. small d democratic education, an education that engages us in our differences and teaches us civil ways of trying to address and resolve them, right? Yeah. These are different points of view. Let's talk about them. Well, Ben, what if it turns out that the demos you know, those pesky citizens that like elect school boards and pay taxes. Yeah. What if it turns out that they don't want that? Right. Yeah. I'm not persuaded that they do. I mean, some people do. I do. Sure. But who am I? And yeah. Ben, I haven't made a good enough case for this. I mean, it's not all my fault and I'm going to keep trying, mm -hmm. but we don't have enough sentiment for that, what I just yeah. described. If we did, we'd have it. Yeah. We do. It. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I feel like yeah, from my experiences, and I guess the the other factor is because you know, uh, a few things. When I was when I would go online in college, yeah, I mean, there's two different ways you can go online. You can either see social media, which is a, you know obviously a dumpster fire, um, or you go on and you read like articles and you see like scholars debating this stuff. So I tended to focus more on the on the on the articles, though everyone sees social media, considering it's that's the world we're living in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I noticed, I guess the the most disturbing shift for me was, and I and I guess this is probably has changed in some school districts, depending on where people live. Uh, but like the school district I went to, I didn't really see too much of an issue with, with culture wars playing out at that time when I was in high school. It seemed mostly just very standardized. And I, I mo most of my issues with uh, education in high school was mostly just the way of people teaching the information, not what was being taught. Um, and, or ben, how... and Ben, where was this? Where where did you grow up? So I went to school. I, I grew up in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so place. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a place with you know, kind of an eclectic mix of people. It's got, you know, a Fort Leavenworth there. It's got, you know, traditional rural Kansans. You get people moving from the inner city of Kansas City. Um, you get the yeah. prison population families for the federal penitentiary and there. Eugene Debs was was incarcerated there. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. After violating all the sedition rules during the First World War, yeah, yeah, and, and went for president from Fort Leavenworth, yep, and got I think a couple million votes, which is kind of yeah, incredible. that's right, yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. it, it's it was an interesting place. I went to school there. I went to high school there for two years. I grew up there my entire life, but I left because the school system was really struggling. Um, mm -hmm. It was mostly trying to keep students from uh, basically having fights with each other and and just you know. There's lots of issues in the school system, and the the school really was more focused on uh, trying to funnel money into their sports programs for like the football team than the education, and that was clearly being shown given the you know the performance of the student body. And I think at the time when I was going there, the school was ranked three out of ten in terms of like the school ratings uh, for school, so it was it was struggling. But, but then, if I may, how does a kid from Leavenworth, Kansas, who isn't Catholic, end up at St. John's in Minnesota? Well, that's another <laughs> it's kind of an interesting journey. So, I mean, 
I, I did two years at Leavenworth High School. Then I went to Shawnee, Kansas and Johnson County, which is a, a much better school system. Um, but basically, my my dad uh, worked at the time for the Commander General Staff College, uh, which was a, a military military university on Fort Leavenworth. He had a colleague uh, that went to St. John's. And so I had I had oh, kind okay. of, you know, been aware of it through that. My brother went to the University of Minnesota. So I had met people who had went to St. John's. And so I just applied there. I thought it was an interesting place. Um, they offered me a huge scholarship and I went and visited. I really liked the atmosphere of it. And uh, so I went there. But uh... Great. Great. That's so, good. Yeah, it was I mean, for, for most of my life, it's been kind of just seeking out interesting experiences. Um, so typically, I like to do things that don't really fit what someone would normally do, like go to That's a private clear. Catholic school yeah. in Minnesota. So I was like, okay, let's try it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so it was interesting. But I guess, you know, when I went to the university, I, I felt this sort of political tension much more. And I had, you know, lots of really good professors there and stuff, but they're like, classes I would take where I would I would just see like wow this is this is you know I could tell that you know some professors have a little bit more of a of a a, a struggle with being objective when they're presenting information oh you think yeah and I was like I was like wow this sounds you know quite a bit like uh, someone's really trying to sell me something here so Right, right. And look, let me just be clear, Ben. I, I think that it's really important that professors have the right to say what they think. Sure. Right. But what they don't have the right to do is to require you to share what they think. And well, that's the distinction yes. that's getting lost over and over again all over the yes. United States. Right. Yep. And and from every side of the political spectrum. So, you know, Ron DeSantis says that the African-American history course is indoctrination because it teaches about reparations. Mm -hmm. Well, if the teacher said, okay, everyone has to support reparations, right, um, or everyone has to be opposed to reparations, or yeah. I'm going to fail you, well, he would be right, right? Yeah. But if the teacher says, hey, kids, what do you think of reparations? Like, the Germans give reparations to Israel. Like, mm -hmm. should we give reparations to Native right. people, so African Americans? That's yeah. not indoctrination. That's education. Right. Right. Having those open um, conversations. Yeah, exactly. And just to be clear, I think and this is the hard part. I mean, to go back to your example, I think the professor should have the right to say what she or he thinks about that. You right. know, um, this is a longstanding debate and it goes back to Alexander Michael John, who I think is the most important 20th century philosopher that we talk the least about. He was a civil libertarian uh, who taught, among other places, at Amherst in Wisconsin. And, you know, Michael John actually said that he thought the teacher should be enjoined to say what she or he thought, because mm -hmm. anything else was dishonest. He yeah. said, like, you know, why pretend that you're sort of this, like, Olympian god up in the sky that lives above all this controversy, right? You're a political creature, just like anybody else. And he thought it was dissembling to pretend that you were neutral. But in the same breath, and this is where it gets so dicey, he said, yeah, you should say what you think. But in the same breath, you have to say that they don't have to think the same thing. Yeah. But that's really hard, right? Especially, yeah. you know, because you're the authority figure and you also have a great deal of, of responsibility and power over these people. You evaluate them, you grade them, right? So how do you create, uh, and this is really the, the, the tough question pedagogically, is how do you create an environment where everyone, including the teacher, is free to say what they think, but right. at the same time, everyone in the class remains free to decide what they think. Yes. Well, and that, that yep. is the hard part. I mean, that was the difference really between professors I had where I thought these are great professors that, you know, I'm sure everyone disagrees with about something when, you know, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. We're always going to disagree about something. But professors that allow for that objective, honest conversations and grades you based on, you know, how... Yeah, you know how well written your argument was versus what your argument was. Uh, you know if they disagreed with it or not. You know you you want someone that embraces students' ability to, to think critically for themselves and have these conversations because that is how we learn. Um, but yeah, I, I did find there are professors that definitely created uh, an environment where students felt like okay, just write what they want to hear so we can get out of this class. And, and, and there's a survey literature suggesting that students do this, too. I mean, this yep. isn't just your 
this isn't just an anecdote, right? I mean, no, no. Ask yeah. Students like, do you tailor your opinions to the professor in the search for a better grade? The answer is majorities do. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a big problem. I mean, I've I think this is something that's happening probably at every university um, because I mean, you just you just talk to a. I mean, there are many professors that I found that I could talk to for for just you know or hear them lecture for five, 10 minutes in a classroom and be able to identify, you know, what they're politically leaning or extremely leaning in some cases, you yes. know, pretty fast. And so it's not hard to tell. And then just the way they present their information um, and how strongly they're presenting it, you just, it creates kind of a chilling effect on conversations in the classroom where people are like, okay, we know this guy is not, is not going to be happy yeah. with us writing something that goes against what they're saying. So. And so, and so the thing, the thing that I try to do in my own classrooms is to make it clear that people do not have to agree with me. Yeah. You know, um, I, I try to be as upfront as I can about my views. And look, let's also remember that at an institution where I teach, everyone is somewhere on the left, including me. Sure. You know, yep. I mean, the, the sad irony, Ben, is because I believe so deeply in this principle of dialogue and speaking across our differences, there's some people on campus that think I'm a Republican. Yeah. Because believe it or not, free speech has been coded as a conservative thing. Yeah. This is deeply distressing and ahistorical. I should tell you I'm a liberal Democrat, and this will not surprise you. I mean, come yeah. on. Like, yeah. you know, I was in the Peace Corps. My dad was in the Peace Corps. I'm Jewish. I have a PhD. I'm yeah. like a cartoon of a liberal Democrat. Right. <laughs> and if you go on to, you know, Americans of Democratic Action, one of those websites sort of take the test of like, what you're how democratic you are i'm like 97 percent pure yeah you know, pure, pro gun control anti-capital punishment pro reproductive rights i mean yeah. everything that you would predict right yeah. so everyone knows that anyway probably yeah. where they can reasonably predict it right um sure. and i don't feel any reason to disguise it but at the same time right i don't want to impose it and most of all, I, I want people to be free to question anything that I say or anything that any, well, anyone else in the class says. Mm -hmm. And unless we teach differently and unless we start to really privilege inquiry over indoctrination, that's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, it's been pretty unfortunate. And I, mean, I, I am curious, uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, to your thoughts specifically on the field of history, because it seems that um, that has become a really interesting topic. And we're both historians, so we both probably have seen some things uh, that other people would not have picked up on if you're not in the field. But obviously, you know, there's been the 1619 Project, there's been the 1776 Commission by Trump. Um, and then there was also the American Historical Association controversy fairly recently. You know, what are your thoughts on that and how the field of history has kind of changed a bit because it seems to me that there's been kind of this influx of of sort of this political activism from people who have entered the field that seem to be kind of using history almost out of context to promote kind of their political viewpoints in a way that well, I, well, I mean, look since you mentioned the aha thing involving james yeah. sweet and sweet he teaches at university of wisconsin i mean this is a good example right because ironically yeah. The column that raised so much hackle that that uh, Jim Sweet wrote yeah. made exactly the same point that you, you just made. Yeah. You know, said that, you know, he believed that a certain sort of presentism, as historians call it, right. which is kind of imposing our own present day predilections on the past, yeah. had distorted the field. Um, yeah. And this created so much consternation that he right. had to do a, a real a, this big mea culpa. And yeah. let me say a couple things. First of all, I, I don't know that guy. I have a lot of admiration for him. Sure. I know his scholarship. And I wrote a column after this saying what I just said, yep. um, but also saying that, you know, I, I wish he hadn't apologized in the way that he did. Yeah. Because his yeah. apology, I think, actually reinforced the problem you're describing. What do you apologize for? And this was his language. Yeah. He apologized for harming the people that disagreed with him. Right. And I do not believe he did that, number one. Yeah. But even if he did, that can't be the rubric for this dialogue. It just can't. No, be. it's right. Yeah. Self-defeating. You know, um, it, it, it's a cul-de-sac. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've seen it play out in places like Hamline and then McAllister over art. Right. Yeah, that's right. Look, yeah. I don't deny that some students felt harmed by those images. I mean, I, I you know, and and and, you know, 
I'm sure that some people did feel harm by what Sweet wrote. Sure. Um, you know, but once that becomes the way we're going to decide what gets said or not, we can't actually be academicians. Um, right. Because yeah. every claim that's worth making is going to create some sort of objection. Right. And once you frame that objection as harm and you say we're not supposed to harm anybody, then we're done. That's right. I mean, right. No conversations happens. ever. That's right. Right. Of course not. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I, I, you know, this can go again in any number of directions. And I've been warning my fellow lefties about this for 10 years. I'm just saying, listen, if you keep weaponizing this thing called harm, the other team is going to do it to you. And you know what? And I say this with great, great regret. I was right. Look mm -hmm. at these gag laws, as PEN America calls them, that are being yeah. passed mostly in the South about schools. And you'll see this language. It says things like, you can't teach anything that's going to make somebody feel they should, uh, they, uh, make somebody believe they should uh, feel guilt or anguish yeah. over their race. Yeah. It's like you can't hurt somebody's feelings. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, once you decide that that's going to be your, your rubric, your barometer, watch out. Yeah. Like what, Jack? Because it's going to be used against something you said. Something oh, sure. you said, right, is going to like harm somebody, yeah. and that's exactly what's happened. Yeah, I mean, it's it's super disturbing because yeah, it, it's a problem that you're getting people on total opposite sides. They're both attacking the idea of a free society and free dialogue. Um, yes, in public education, and it's like people like. Anyone who cares about this stuff, you guys need to, you know, join together and and sort of back these people off. So. Yes, right, right, and you know, um, I I I like that formulation, and I think the joining together is really important because if we're talking about these these gag laws, right, the team behind the gag laws is joined together. Think of a group like Moms for Liberty. Yeah. So you know, um, the answer to Moms for Liberty, by the way, is not you're really stupid and you should butt out. That's sure. what Terry McAuliffe essentially said in Virginia. And that's one of the big reasons Glenn Youngkin is the governor of that state. Right. Because yep. Terry McAuliffe said, and this was a totally unforced error, but I think I think a, a, a suicidal one. He mm -hmm. said, you know, I just don't think that parents should have any kind of say in this. Of course they should. They always have and they always will. If you don't like what Moms for Liberty is doing, don't tell them to butt out. Butt in. Yeah. Butt in. Right? Um, you know, make moms for freedom. And it's only been, this is happening. I mean, there are groups doing this, you know, uh, moms for, you know, intellectual dialogue, moms for conversation across our differences. Sure. Uh, it is happening, but again, in a minor key. And I think that's the answer here. Um, yeah. You know, to your earlier point is people that really want our kids to be educated, not indoctrinated, have to join together and say that loudly over and over again. Mm -hmm. We live in a divided society. We know this. What we need are schools that both accept and address those differences. It's real, right? This yeah. is an opinion. This is a fact, right? We have different views of America. I, I could document that in a hundred ways. No yes. reasonable person can test that. The only question is what to do about it, Right. And those of us who believe that the answer to that question is to expose our students to those differences so that they come to a reasoned view of them and what they think, we have to join together, just like you said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of get the impression also that, you know, when it comes to American society, generally speaking, that most Americans have no interest in partaking in culture wars, but just want their kids to be educated. Um, I, I feel like, though, many Americans... You know, they've things they're worrying about with like personal life, jobs, you know, taking care of their families that they don't feel like they have the time to to sort of engage politically in preventing this chaos. And so it's kind of like, how can we get you know, the, the collective uh, majority, I think, of Americans that, you know, have no interest in this, but just want their kids right. to get a good job later and have a, a good life. Um, together, right. So. And, and, and look, I mean, this this makes the culture wars more like other political battles in America. Right. The political scientists have been reminding us of this for a long time, which is that in both parties, the people at the extremes tend to have the most influence. Yes. Right. That's that's in part because of the way the primary system works. It's in part because of the kind of media ecology that the parties have developed. Right. But you're yeah. right. There are a lot of people that have no time for this. 
in both senses, right? Both literally and metaphorically, right? Um, uh, but I mean, how many of them want the exercise that I described earlier? Yeah. Honestly, I mean, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I'd like to know, you know, um, but um, uh, I think that, you know, uh, most people don't have any time for this, as you've said, but I don't think most people have been persuaded that our schools should have time for it, if you catch yeah. my drift, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. That our schools should actually be addressing these questions so we find a better way to talk about them. Yep, that's true. Yeah, so, you know, what gives you hope then for the future? Because I'm sure there are people that, you know, listening to this that are pretty concerned with how things are headed and they're, they're wondering, okay, yeah. so what can, what can be done? You know, what's going to happen? Yeah. Well, look, you know, um, I think one thing that gives me hope for the future is that thanks to figures like Ron DeSantis, there's more awareness of these questions, right? Uh, uh, more public awareness, right? Mm -hmm. So you're right. Most people don't have the time for it, but I think more people are developing that time, if you, if you yeah. will, and are paying more sick, attention yeah. <laughs> because I think figures like DeSantis have nationalized the question. You know, journalists yeah. will often call me and ask me about him and what I think is new about this. And what I think is new, to go back to the very beginning, we were talking about, you know, where the culture wars come from, what's new about them. I think what's new at this moment is that they're taking on a more national cast. The culture wars in our schools have historically been almost entirely local and state uh, in their breath because that's how we govern schools in America, yeah. right? And it's still how we govern schools and Ron DeSantis isn't gonna change that. But I think in the era of social media, I think what, what Ron DeSantis has successfully done is he's managed to make a kind of national platform around issues that were formerly almost all state and local. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways that's quite frightening. Um, uh, if like me, you disagree with what Ron DeSantis has to say sure. or almost everything he has to say. <laughs> But at the same time, you know, I think I think it's it's a good thing that more citizens are becoming aware of these questions, what the public schools are teaching or not, what school libraries are, what their role is, how we decide what books our, our kids should read. If you believe in democracy, you should want more people engaged in those questions, not fewer. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Um, it's uh you would hope that more people would uh, would sort of chime in on this and and uh, you know want to make sure that we can get back on the right track in terms of education in the U.S. Uh, so we'll hope for the best. <laughs> Indeed, we will. Yeah. So, yeah. what are you currently working on then? Well, I'm starting a new book uh, that's been slow out of the gate because of the pandemic, and sure. ironically. That book is a history of schools and universities during epidemics and pandemics. Oh, wow. There's okay. A funny meta story here. Like I couldn't get into any of the archives yeah. to research my book about epidemics and pandemics because <laughs> our pandemic had closed the archives. Wow. It's a sign. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 But now they're opening up. And, um, you know, what really interests me there is um, not just how our schools and universities have addressed pandemics, that is what policies they've developed, because of course there have always been pandemics and epidemics, especially ecologists, because as you know, everyone lives literally on top of each other, right? Yeah. So, you know, Harvard closed down for a while in the 17th century because of smallpox, uh, yeah. the 18th century, sorry, in the 1700s. Um, uh, so there's nothing new about that. Um, but what interests me isn't just the way that our colleges and universities have figured out how to address these crises. It's how they teach about them, how they narrate them. This is what I think is so interesting about schools, right? They live in our society, but they also have to teach us about our society, yes. right? So our educational institutions, they have to figure out, okay, are we gonna stay open or closed? Are we gonna require people to be vaccinated, right? Are we gonna, are we gonna distance them or space them in some ways? Of course they have to do that, just like any other institution, like a bank, right? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, any other, you know, a car company. What's different about the schools and universities, which are not banks and car companies, is they also have to teach us again how to think about these subjects, right? They have to tell stories about them, right? And they have to help us figure out how we make meaning of them. Sure. So that's what the schools and universities have done. At the same time, they've created these policies. And so that's the dynamic that interests me. Uh, and, and look, I mean, you know, there are going to be differences of culture. 
and differences uh, uh, of uh, conceptions of America and of freedom. I mean, all the other things I've studied are going to enter into this project, right? Yeah, I mean, just definitely. look at the last pandemic we went through, right? I mean, so much of our debate about things like vaccines and masks was obviously inflected by our very deep cultural differences about what we think America is. Yes. What we think terms like freedom mean. Uh, what our duties are to our fellow citizens. So all that stuff, which I've spent my career studying, it will be in here too, believe me. I just have to figure <laughs> out how. Yeah. I guess your book has gotten longer over time because of the new pandemic that just happened. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we'll keep doing new editions, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And what's the best way for people to keep track of your work and, and follow you and stuff? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not a social media guy. And the reason is, is that, um, uh, is that if I did it, I, I, I would be too distracted. I, yeah. I know myself well enough to yeah. know. That's that wise. As it, as it is. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I have some readers that have a Google alert that just put my name in there. Yeah. You know, okay. Cool. Right? That works. Um, that's the easiest way because, and also, you know, if you Google me, um, Jonathan Zimmerman, University of Pennsylvania. Now, the way that Google works, they show you my last couple of columns. It'll be yeah. right there. We'll just That's see cool. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Well, Good. thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your expertise. I mean, your 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 field is basically, you know, one of the most important in modern history right now, given how much education is shaping societies and the debates about it are. Um, so. yes. Well, well, you know, my, my mom agrees with you. I'm very important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, I'm and, glad. <laughs> yeah. And, and she also thinks I'm devastatingly handsome. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Also good okay. to, yeah, to talk with a, another historian about uh, things that are happening in the field. Uh, that, um, so, yeah, interesting times. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, it's great to talk to you.